Hello and welcome to coverage of GP Portland. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen, and we've got Paul Rietzel versus Michael Hans lined up for you. You can see Bant Company and Paul Rietzel. He's, has he further innovated this, this deck? It feels like maybe he has. He has, as a matter of fact. In, in a subtle way. He's playing against Black Green Delirium here. What, what did he do? What, what, what was the thing that Paul did that was different about these Bant Company decks that we've seen uh, you know, over the past three, four months? So normally you see Bant Company decks that are a pile of creatures, four Collected Company, and four Dramokas Command. Paul has cut the Dramokas Command and replaced the Dramokas Command with three additional creatures and a singleton <laughs> copy of Ojutai's Command. Uh, that's funny. So now he's 26 lands, Collected Companies, a singleton Ojutai's Command, and creatures. It makes cards like Duskwatch Recruiter much better in his deck, makes Collected Company much better. It's also, funny because I think people had kind of settled, you know, oh, this is yeah, how many, yeah. you know, you need 22 or whatever it is, number of creatures, you know, in these decks. And they thought, well, that's enough. That had become the, the norm for that. That is what you need. And if you have more, that's fine or whatever, but less you can't do. But it turns out more is better in this a scenario. Lot better. You hit more often. I mean, we saw plenty of times at the Pro Tour that people would miss with their collected companies or only hit one creature. And you know, it just happens Less percentage of the time for Paul with this build. Now, he gives up Dramacus Command, which offers a lot of flexibility, but it is really not well positioned right now, so I don't think it's a big loss for, for Paul. Yeah, now that the format's becoming more controlling, it's less likely that Dramacus Command is really going to be that tempo blowout. You're not going to get two for ones with it as often. In the meantime, Michael is going to send the Reflector Mage to the slaughter here as Paul has decided to keep. His Duskwatch Recruiter, which you can see why that card can be a source of long term card advantage for him if this game hits that mid to late game stride. He also adds a tireless tracker, a land, and a clue to his battlefield. So, Paul Rietzel, and I gotta say, I mean, his deck is designed to maximize on this angle, but man, has he been curving out. <laughs> he has just been using up all, you know, his, his drops and really doing a great job uh, keeping the pressure on. His opponents, every time I saw, we saw him yesterday in the future match area as well, and it was the same thing. It was just creature, 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 you know, just hammering his opponent and, you know, really kind of punishing people for using up their mana on cards like with like what Michael's doing here, right? He's, he's using a Vessel of Nascency, which is a, it's a, it's a clunky card. I, you, there's no other way to put it. You've got to invest three mana in that thing. And, uh, you know, it does, it does a good job for what the deck's trying to do. But uh, in the meantime, hey, take four, take six, you know, and... and Things start to get a little sketchy when Paul's playing cards like Reflector Mage that can, you know, your big finisher play or your big stabilization can just say, yeah, but we just get, get rid of that for a turn and whack you for the rest of it, you know? So I like what Paul's doing here a lot. I, it's simple, but often that's correct. It's consistent. It does seem to have upped the consistency a little bit on the deck as well. Yeah, I think oftentimes people... Uh shy away from simplicity, but simplicity is often synonymous with consistency. And having did, did your you games Did you read that on like out, a poster? No. I'm, well, <laughs> like some guy climbing a mountain? Me. It's all me. <laughs> that was all you. Uh, all right. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen that poster. <laughs> Man, it's like subconscious. Uh, actually, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm I the one who made those posters. <laughs> I, just, uh -huh. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen the poster. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. <laughs> so Tireless Tracker is going to go ahead and get a clean attack here because Paul can leave up the two mana to crack that clue and make it a little bigger. And uh, that means that Michael's forced to just take the damage, which means that Paul then gets to use the two mana not on cracking the clue, but instead what we were just talking about, Jake, which is developing his board even further. Now he's got a Sylvan Advocate, too. Look at this. Yeah, his board is huge, and he still has a ton of cards in hand, and he has multiple clues in play. Yeah, I think one of the biggest strengths of the changes that Paul made is that, you know, he his games are going to play out the same way more often than not. Mm. Yeah, and Paul, you know, he certainly is an expert when it comes to the, you know, this, this creature. Like, he's very much at home when it comes to creature combat, sneaking through points of damage, figuring out lines of play that will earn him the victory through combat. And it looks like Paul's got a handy little note there to show us 
which creature is being affected by Liliana's plus ability. Thank you, Paul. That is handy. Paul is, he's an interesting character. You know, if you've ever seen an interview with him, he'll spend a good three quarters of the interview telling you about how great other players are. Yes. And he'll spend the, the rest of it telling you how he's not as good as them. Yeah, and how he's just lucky. Yeah, and it's meanwhile he's complete the nonsense. actual best. He is a <laughs> superb technical player. He is has one of the best work ethics in the game. This guy puts in the time. He's not the type that just shows up to a tournament and is like, "Hey guys, I somebody handed me a deck. Let's see what happens." That's not his style at all. And uh, yeah, when I interview him, I don't let him do that. I'm, Seriously. Yeah, shut I mean, him up real quick when yeah, he starts I mean, talking, he's talking a, himself down. He's a superbly <laughs> good magic player, and that's just the truth. Like, I totally get it, right? Like, bragging and stuff, is it doesn't come off well, and it, it it's not his style. Mm -hmm. But the truth is the truth, and that, that matters. And and the truth is is that Paul is, is really an all-timer. He is an absolutely fantastic player. as we see here. You know, this Tyler's tr tracker continuing to grow while Paul continues to draw more and more cards. Those look like the pair of Sylvan Advocates, though, have at least provided a reasonable speed bump here for Michael as he's been able to hide behind them and not take any damage that last turn. The Tyler's Tracker couldn't quite get up to six power, so a uh, double block there. Wouldn't have been great for Paul. Instead, choosing to just bide his time. And here's another Vessel of Nascency now for Michael. And Ooh, I he looked at one too many. he did go a little too deep into the library here. So they'll have to have a judge come over. He's about to draw that card anyway, and Paul is tapped out, so... Not really the end of the world. No. And you can see what the resolution oh. is for this. Okay. Yeah, this is the type of thing that is usually pretty easy to resolve uh, just because he looked at an extra card, but it's not the same thing as drawing it or any of that nonsense. It gets a little more complicated when you get into that realm. So this one, in this case, he's just going to have to shuffle here, it looks like. It could have easily been a dexterity mistake. All right, they got that sorted out. And this is now the Vessel of Nascency ability resolving. It looks like he's decided to take a Den Protector though he's kind of just left it floating there. How about we, there we go. It's better in your hand anyway here, Michael. Paul under some pressure here, though. I mean, the problem is that there's an Immarkle in Michael's hand, and Paul's going to have to close quick. I feel like next turn is going to be an exciting one, but that should not transform back. He, he only cast one spell that turn. He did use a bunch of mana up, which always feels like you've cast multiple spells, <laughs> but it was just the Den Protector that he cast there. So Paul has that Lumbering Falls. He can cast the Reflector Mage in his hand here. He has a lot of good options. He's also got an Archangel Avison, as well as a Collected Company in hand. A couple other cards, too. This is a blazing fast start for Rietzel. Is this a turn where he's able to pile in a ton of damage, or is this one where he's going to have to switch gears and start moving for the whole uh, the longer game plan, which his deck is very capable of doing. 
It did transform back. Did he cast the vessel that turn? Yeah, Sorry. I believe he cast and cracked Thank the vessel. Thank you. I, I, missed, I missed him casting it. I thought yeah. he already had it. All right, so that was my mistake. So what we saw he there... He went earlier also, so that's what was confusing. Yeah, they kind so, of so what happened there was Paul yeah. was deciding if there was anything he wanted to do while he still had the discount. Basically, any instant speed creatures. And he does have a Spell Queller in hand here. He also has Collected Company... A lot of different options here for Paul. I mean, if he has a sixth land, then he gets to leave open access to both of those because passing the turn would flip over the Duskwatch Recruiter, making the spell caller only cost two. It's an interesting option there. I feel like he also would very much like to get some loyalty off this Liliana right now. Yeah, it looks like Paul's just going to pass the turn back. That does retransform his Duskwatch recruiter, though. So, Michael, hands now. Some options. I believe we may just see a thirteen thirteen come down, which would be disastrous for Paul, considering how Michael's board currently looks. He may not have it yet. The Emrakul? Well, he yeah. may not have the. He may need to wait for. Yeah. One more land. He does. You can see. I think he's pulled out those four cards to indicate. Is that possible? Or is it just a sloppy graveyard? I think those were from the most recent uh, vessel. Okay. So option B. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say from here. Yeah, right? yeah. All right, so collected company for Paul Rietzel. And he's found a couple of nice ones there, Selfless Spirit and a Tireless Tracker. I think he would have loved to see a Reflector Mage in that pile to complement the one that he's got in his hand. But so it goes. Okay, collected company into... Reflector Mage. Players One of the ways of dealing with Emrakul once casting your opponent's turn. And you can see that Michael's now transforming, or excuse me, uh, unmorphing his Den Protector to get back a Grasp of Darkness. And he's going to aim it at the Tireless Tracker, the big one. But thanks to the uh, Liliana ability, it does actually shrink it down small enough to kill it. Able to get one of those off the table. Ooh, a few Reflector Mages in hand there for Paul. He does have two in his hand. I believe only the one blue mana source. Yeah, it looks like it. Paul's deck is just... So streamlined, doing the same thing every game over and over again. Not really a spot he wants to be in, though. I think he really wants to be the aggressor, and now he had, it's been a lot of turns where he's not attacked. Indeed. Yeah, wow, those, uh, those Sylvan Advocates really holding down the fort here for Michael. Yeah, they've been really good this game. Now we get to see Paul Rietzel do the, the finger dance here as he does math, and this is not what you want to see if you're in Michael's. See, Paul is basically planning the way that he's going to kill you. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to work every time, but he's going to find the best way to do it. And in they come. I believe. Yeah, he has not quite locked in these attacks, but he's running the numbers. You can see that Michael is effectively tapped out with just the two forests there. There's going to be no removal spells cast. So Paul has good information about how this combat is going to go. He can accurately predict what Michael's going to do as far as blocks and where that puts him moving forward. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that we did see earlier that Paul has an Archangel Avacyn in his hand. Yeah. And he can use that to save any creatures that would be eaten in combat and, of course, bolster his board up a bit, too. It's absolutely true. The other thing to keep in the mind, we saw this yesterday 
is that, you know, you, and you mentioned it a few minutes ago when we were talking about Addison and Jake, is that he does have the selfless spirit. And if, if Michael takes too much damage here, he could put himself in range of that transform ability from Archangel Avacyn, take three damage and die. That, that is something that could happen as well. So this is a tricky spot here for Michael. He, he needs to maintain as much of his life total as possible. My assumption is that Paul has sent all of these creatures at Michael and has ignored Liliana here. And that does seem to be the case. Did Michael at 13. It's clear the Liliana's continuing to go up, looking to ultimate. And it seems that Paul is going to get in there. Oh, this is an interesting line from Rietzel. So he's going to sacrifice the selfless spirit rather than play the Archangel Addison in here. And it was at Liliana. Okay. Okay, so he is trying yeah. to contain here. And this is also interesting because by playing it this way, Paul can develop his board even further, playing the Duskwatch Recruiter for one, and st still leave up that mana for Archangel Avacyn here. This is some subtle stuff here from Rietzel. I am really curious to see how this pans out for him. Archangel Avacyn at four mana is even better. That is pretty busted, no doubt about it. A lot of exciting cards in his hand, too. go. Archangel Avacyn is going to jump in front. Paul perhaps luring Michael into this. And not using Angel on the previous attack. Yeah, you know, and of course Michael just said, this. yeah, well, whatever. I got good attacks. <laughs> <laughs> now he's going to take no damage as Paul Rietzel and one of the Sylvan Advocates is just going to get gobbled up here. Wow. And now Seems Paul's really good. forcing Michael to have something here. Look at the board. <laughs> it's gotten completely out of hand so quickly. Oh, but he does have something. That's certainly Emrakul. something. And you see, by the way, something I definitely recommend, which was Paul counting out the Players different card types in his opponent's one, graveyard four, to make sure that he had enough to cast it. It is so easy to overlook that and to be one mana short with Emrakul. Been playing a deck on Magic Online that has Emrakul in it. And, you know, Magic Online's really handy for that. It always is kind of telling you. But in real life, it's not as obvious. And it changes sometimes. So pretty interesting here. Paul has two copies of Reflector Mage. Okay. And uh, he's going to be able to Reflector Mage. Yeah. Emrakul, because of the way things work out. So able to really save himself there. Yeah, the question is, what does this board state look like after all this, right? That, that's the thing I want to know. Because, I mean, can't Michael set up a scenario where Archangel Avacyn is going to transform? That's, you that's know, to, certainly... To, to wipe away all the other creatures outside of that uh, Sylvan Advocate? I mean, look, I'm not saying too. it's perfect, yeah. right? Like, you, he, Michael also takes three in that scenario and also is facing down a 6-5 flyer. So I, I, obviously we're going to have to let Michael figure out what the optimal line is here. Looks like Michael's going to cast Reflector Mage on behalf of Paul and return his own Emrakul to his hand. Did he, what did he, did he, and he attacked the uh, Sylvan Advocate in it, into it before that. Huh, this actually did not go so badly for... For who? For Paul. Did it not? Let's find out. Because his Sylvan Advocate died. Yeah, but... So that's going to transform, and it's going to kill all the other creatures. Yeah, now, I mean, the thing is, is that it, Michael's at four, 
Well, if he attacks so, Michael. Here. Yeah, Michael's going to take three, go to ten, and then can take six more in the air. He can get him to one. No, not quite. Sylvan Advocate holding down the fort down there. Also, Paul doesn't have a second blue for Lumbering Falls anyway. Wow, th this is going to be interesting because Paul also has to make the decision on if he wants to attack Liliana or attack Michael. I don't think it turned out great for Paul here, though. <laughs> it was a oh, lot of creatures hitting the bin, man. That pretty brutal. All right, so there's the other Reflector Mage that Michael saw in hand. He knew that that was there. And it looks like Paul's just going to develop out his board now. Is it Liliana or is it Michael? This is the question. It looks like it's Michael. Yes. He has attacked Michael. Michael's at six, apparently. Life total may have been wrong prior to that because it didn't show quite the same. But as expected, here comes Emrakul again. And can Paul survive getting Emrakul again? It wrecked him last time. He lost, what, five creatures to that Emrakul? Six creatures? He's going to crack this Evolving Wilds on end step just, just so that uh, Michael doesn't get to do it for him. Yeah, yeah. You don't want your opponent to be cracking your Evolving Wilds. No, we know how that ends. <laughs> you know, I looked and looked. <laughs> couldn't find one. Where are these lands? Just going to shuffle up. <laughs> I am really curious to see if Paul can actually mm -hmm. find a win here, though. If not, Michael needs to just frame those self and advocates that kept him alive turn after turn after turn in the <laughs> early part of that game. Okay, it was a spell queller for Rietzel. This is a pretty close one, right? So he runs the angel into the 13-13. Then, yeah, if Michael's at six, then. He is, he is. So uh, is, th there was a Liliana yeah. activation on our, on Avison. Oh, and that was. That's yeah, why it was, yeah, it was that, four that and more six. Sense. Yeah, chat pointed okay. that out to us after we uh, mentioned the life total there. Huh, so if he were at four, Paul would probably win. But considering he's at six, it's pretty tight here. So Paul's going to lose Avison, right? Presumably. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's a case to be made, depending on Michael's hand, to just killing the uh, Advocate, because it does add up to potentially more damage with the Lumbering Falls. But not flying is kind of a big game here. And yeah, he's going to take down Avison. And that's it. Okay. It's at seven. It's at seven that you get to ultimate that thing, Paul. So you've got to... You've got a turn here with Michael at six. Michael, reminding him, I did not play that land for you. That's right. It was uh, his card drawn for the turn there. All right, so Lumbering Falls can attack for five. Don't think Paul has an attack here, does he? Doesn't look like it. So close. Could get him the two. On the band event, Roger, number nine. Please meet. Michael draws his card. Doesn't look too thrilled about it. You can see a look on his face like, eh, is this good enough? But he does have Emrakul on the battlefield. And now he's got a Sylvan Advocate as well. Oh, but Ojatai's command is going to oh, counter wow. that. This could be huge, especially if Paul can find more action. Yeah. And there it is. Counter that, get a Sylvan Advocate. That's exactly what Paul wanted to see happen. Okay, but, and there's that Spell Queller from before as well. Oh, there's a Languish from Michael. Oh, man, he also plus Liliana on the uh, Sylvan wow. Advocate to kill that. What a beating for Michael. He just drew out yeah. that spell queller, lined everything up. Set him up and knocked him down. Ugh. Really nice play there from Michael. Ugh. Set that turn up perfectly.
Oh, that was gross. Wow. <laughs> Look at Paul. I this has been an exactly awesome how it feels. Game. Yeah. This has been a great game. Oh. Think about the, those two Sylvan Advocates in the early game just holding the fort down for Michael. I mean, he, they're, they God dang. easily prevented 18 damage. Oh, and, and Michael, too, with the, a with the really big finish, he was going to ultimate Liliana with Emrakul out. You know how there's, like, this flavor thing about, like, <laughs> zombie? It's like, how about just both on your side? <laughs> uh, what a great game. Cool stuff from both players, but Michael Hans, Hans is going to be the one who takes game one from Paul. Yeah, winning on as many avenues as possible. Yeah. I like it. It was just a, a really cool turn from Hans there. You know, like, he had the tools to get the job done, and he had the information. He just needed to make sure he sequenced it right, and Paul had really no decisions, you know, during the course of that. But it looked like Paul was going to win after the Ojedice command, and especially after the Spell Queller. But given the draw that, that Michael had, he knew, oh, I can get that Spell Queller from him and then wipe the board. It was just a great turn. Really cool stuff. In the meantime, Alan Wu versus Jin Sui. And what do we got here? So oh, got this is that four-color amalgam deck from, from Jin we saw earlier. Yeah, Zin Sui right now, last undefeated player in the room. Depending on how you define undefeated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm with you on that definition. Though yeah. Alan Wu technically also undefeated. And you know what that means. When you let your opponent go to their upkeep and start sacrificing creatures. Attention. It's Elder Deep Fiend players. time. Yeah, this four-color amalgam deck is so awesome to watch. I don't know if you guys have seen much of this, but the deck chains together Elder Deep Fiends once it applies like some semblance of pressure, and then it just bashes the opponent a few times and kills them. But the really exciting thing about this deck is how well it abuses Jace Brin's Prodigy. What do you like about it? Oh, you're filling your graveyard quickly with things like Vessel of Nascency or Gather the Pack, and your Jace is essentially a two-mana Planeswalker, and... It takes over games so quickly. So Especially you're seeing a lot of the times you can transform Jace like right away, first activation. Yeah, and and grabbing the past also like with Jace, it, you can actually use your Jace activation to create a board presence or mm. to get creatures, mm. which is something that a lot of decks that have had Jace in the past have tried to do and failed. People even played Bring Delight in the old format just so they could do that, mm -hmm. just so that their Jace could minus could also be creatures. Now, since we a uh, reasonable board, the thing is the pair of four fives on the other side makes it a harder attack. But well, he's sending in. He's not gonna not gonna be fearful there. All right. Well, our main match is back underway. Let's head back over there. I want to see the uh, Paul Rietzel versus Michael Hans match. Looks like we're just in the early stages here. A Sylvan Advocate, perfect start here for Rietzel. And Michael, with the Grasp of Darkness off the top, <laughs> a perfect answer for it. So this is kind of how the early turns are supposed to go. The Bant deck can easily grind through this type of scenario. But the Black Green Delirium deck also has the ability to answer everything as we see another Grasp of Darkness. Also, you'll note that, that Paul Rietzel has already, you know, he kind of like cracked that Evolving Wilds while Michael was doing his stuff. And this is in reference to the fact that these matches take a long time. Game one yeah. took a long time, and it's really both players want to be able to finish, so Paul's taking a little bit of shortcuts here, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that from Michael as well. Paul clearly representing this right here, Collected Company. By the way, I love it when players play quick like this. It's so it's much more best. fun to yeah, commentate yeah, yeah. when they're just blazing right through like that. But here we go. Let's see what he hits. Remember, this is a deck that... a Reflector Mage there. Okay. This is a, a, you know, a, a list that Paul Rietzel has really tried to maximize Collected Company in, in the most, like, possible way he can. Wow. Pair of Sylvan Advocates. That could be good. Obviously, Collected Company decks build their list, you know, with, with this card in mind, with these cards in mind, but Paul's really taking it to the next level. He, he cut Dromica's commands and replaced them with creatures that you can hit with Collected Company. Yeah, he found a way to make the best cards in the deck better. You know, Reflector Mage, it's better when you have more guys. So I'm playing more guys. Collect Company, it's better when you're playing more creatures. He's playing more creatures. Oh, when you have a two-drop, your hand's so good. 
playing more two drops. It just seems really, really good to me. Michael is now upkeep casting the third Grasp of Darkness on the game, but he has opened up the door a little bit for a Spell Queller. At least he made Paul use that mana on his turn, which was what his goal was. In the meantime, Paul gets to jam with the two. That's a lot of damage right here. Creatures, yeah, that was land number six that he played before, so Michael has to take, what, eight here? Ouch. Yeah. Already done ten. Lethal damage there on Paul's side of the table. Man, you said it in the first in the first game though, JVL. <laughs> Paul's deck is so consistent. It does the same thing. It's just every done the game. same thing every game, yeah, and it's like why often it's so good amazing. enough. Yeah. yeah. Also caught a glimpse of uh, of a Gideon in hand there for Paul. Looks like he's brought that in out of the sideboard. Oh, nice. That seems really good in a matchup like this. Yeah, where you can get your Sylvan Advocates bigger than your opponent Sylvan Advocates, you know, with an emblem. Also, he just tends to have a lot of creatures on the battlefield. I really like the direction Paul's gone with this deck. It's very much my style. A few years ago, Jerry Thompson sent me a deck to play in a PDQ that was just 32 creatures and four Bonfire of the Damned. Every single game played out the exact same way. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is interesting. Michael's going to play a land and then attack with his... Uh, Sylvan Advocate there, so Paul has to try to decide exactly what that means and if he can do anything about it. Sometimes you figure out what it means, but then you can't do anything about it anyway. You know, it doesn't change your course of play, and in this case, Paul's just going to take it. Could easily be a Liliana in hand there for Michael. That's the kind of card that can make you regret blocking. Yeah, ah, it's I a Guilt Leaf Winner. Ooh, that's a really good one. Yeah, the Guilt Leaf Winner is going to kind of send a little cascade going here. But the good news for Paul Rietzel is that the Spellqueller held on to that Grass of Darkness long enough for him to hit his six, sixth land drop and it's not going to kill anything anymore. It's a big and, deal. And look how wise he was taking both advocates out of that collected company, recognizing that, and that instead was the of the reflector that's going mage? to yeah. yeah. Yeah, I keep going back to that decision as well. Pretty incredible. Because he had a target for reflector mage and it's really tempting to just be like, yeah, get your advocate out of here. I'll get to attack you next turn. But you're right. Paul Rietzel figured out that this game was going to go at least until the advocates were relevant as far as being four fives, and uh, he wanted two of them. It looks like Michael's decided to double block. Remember, the Guilt Leaf Winnower can't target elves. That's why he didn't get to actually <laughs> kill anything here and has to just play it as a 4-3. A oh, he, well, he killed the... What did he kill? The Spell Queller? The Spell Queller. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. It just... the. He didn't get to use the spell from the spell caller effectively. Because yeah, of and I mean, he, and, and, you know, part of what I'm saying here, I suppose, <laughs> is that, you know, he would much prefer to kill one of these advocates. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Especially with how good that can be with the, uh, with the creature lands that Paul has access to. Guilty if Winnower is weird. It is a very weird card. Or maybe it doesn't like weird cards, but... Always found that card a little strange. It enters a, uh, a unique area of design space where they talk about, you know, power and toughness being mm -hmm. different. Yeah. It's kind of a hypocrite, though, isn't it? Yeah, he's like a uh, Gilly Winner. That doesn't really seem like a a nice elf. It also know. just has uneven power and toughness. But yeah. Yeah. All right, tireless <laughs> tracker for Michael, who's fallen all the way down to two life. Self-loathing, if you will. <laughs> can Paul finish him off and force a game three? And can he do it in a timely fashion? Again, if you've been keeping up with us yesterday and today here from Portland, we entered the grind zone here as far as this format. There is definitely a lot of uh, long, drawn-out games similar to the first game that we saw between Paul and Michael. You know, Paul's just going to fire up a uh, Duskwatch Recruiter here and even activate it. Going directly for that, <laughs> that line there. Looks like he's found himself a Reflector Mage. He's going to get to attack with both, which is going to force two chump blocks from Michael and really put the heat on him. 
We may be done here. We may be going to a game three. It's a lot of lethal threats there from Rietzel. Okay, well, here's an Ishkana. That will help. Certainly help a lot. What's in Paul's hand now? Cards are really good at catching up against Bank, bank Company. We saw that a lot last weekend. The Pro Tour. Paul's deck list over there. May, may I see Let's that? Let's see. Here you go. See what Paul's got lined up here. Looks like he's just going to go ahead and activate that Duskwatch Recruiter again. And I think he whiffed that time. Looks like Paul's out of gas here as well. Doesn't need much, though. All right, and that's going to be game. So That's all she wrote. That's it. So Paul Rietzel's going to even things up at one game apiece against Michael. And I do... It's interesting. I... I think I missaw that Gideon earlier from Paul. He does have one in his board, but he clearly didn't have one in his hand at the end of the game there. Yeah, it could have been uh, I, I might have just you something know, else. seen something else, yeah. He does, he does have one in his board. His board's pretty broad. Lots of one-ofs and a pair of two-ofs in, in his sideboard. We'll, we'll get to that as we go back to that match. But first, we've got yet another one to check in on here. Jin versus Allen. Yes, that is a guru land. Interesting yes, that I am uh, jealous. Go ahead. Infinite obliteration has been cast this game by okay. Alan Wu. I'm interested to hear what he had I taken. Think, I think it actually got duressed looking oh, at got the board here. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, that taking prized amalgam could be disastrous oh. for Zin Sui. Interesting. That's what you'd name, huh? I would absolutely name prized amalgam yeah. against this deck. Yeah. And so if you're if you are playing against a four-color amalgam deck and you have access to Infinite Obliteration in your board, then uh, bring it in and name prized amalgam because it will take a lot of the... You think it's a safe bet <laughs> naming the card that the deck is named after <laughs> in most scenarios? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. I didn't even think about <laughs> it that If it's way. called four-color amalgam, just, <laughs> just name that one. <laughs> These players are going to game three already, or, or in game three, excuse me, already. Yeah, the, uh, these matches are taking a while. I mean, the standard format is really, really complicated. Can't sh take quick turns and throw priority back and forth. So when are we throwing games away? Black Green Delirium out in force here for sure. All right, let's jump back over to uh, to Paul Rietzel and Michael Hans. Michael's going to be the one on the play here, and he's going to kick things off with his uh, Lanowar Waste casting Traversal of the Waltz for a Swamp. This is another thing we see. The Bank Company deck, while very strong all the time, really overperforms on the play. I think just being yeah. able to you know play two drop and then reflector mage everything your opponent plays off the board and oh, keep yeah. attacking it's just so hard to deal with i have seen that before all right pair of two drops one for each player here michael's down to 18 thanks to the lanowar ways and paul's going to snap off the block which is interesting yeah that's that's a interesting wow. block i mean if michael had a liliana paul could have kind of gotten blown out there well here's the thing michael does have a liliana he just didn't have a third land Wow. <laughs> you think Paul just, like, soul read him? Look, <laughs> Paul Paul is roughly 18 times better at magic than I am. I guarantee I you he I had a reason for thing. that. Yeah, yeah. I guarantee that he knew what he, he was doing, and I am absolutely going to ask him about it the next time I see him. Let me know what he says. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So he had a, uh, a Thalia there, which could have really been a nice one, um, but it did get Grasp of Darkness off of Michael's only two mana here. And uh, Paul's going to set back Michael even further. Michael really needs to find a land, and he did. Now we could see Liliana. Or maybe if he has like a Nissa or something like that to keep the lands going. Let's see what he's got. It's going to be Liliana. Can't recast the Advocate this turn anyway, so... 
not many decisions there. Yeah, it was really good for him to hit that land because, you know, how miserable is it to be stuck on two lands, have a two drop in your hand and not even be able to cast yeah. it? It's just the worst. It happens all the time. Yeah, too. it does. <laughs> Feels like this is Paul's game to win, but we've seen this before. You know, right now, Michael's sitting there with five or six spells in his hand, and if he can go land, land off the top, you know, and Paul maybe has a few too many lands. Now, the big question mark here is, does Paul have a collected company, right? He has played a tap land and passed a turn. If he's able to company on end step here, then things could get interesting. If he doesn't have it, then Paul could actually fall behind, assuming that, uh, that Michael's able to keep hitting his land drops. I assume he's got to have it, though. Why? He hasn't played many spells. Okay. When you have that many cards left in your hand and you pass with that mana open. Yeah, what does he have, two or three cards left in his hand? No, he's got four. Yeah. yeah. He's got to have it. All right, and he does. Collect the company. Let's see what he hits. This is big. This is really, really big. He's got to hit well here. And he did. <laughs> That's a sweet shortcut, by the way. I like that shortcut a lot. Yeah, he, he played a Nissa, and he, there was a forest in the revealed cards. He's just like, eh, put that in my hand. He also hit a Spell Queller, which is going to do a good job of pressuring either Michael's life total or Liliana, depending on what, what Paul feels like he wants to do here. Michael did find land number four with an Evolving Wilds there. It looks like Paul has another collected company, too. I don't see how Paul loses if he does have another collected company here. His deck is so well set up to hit as often as possible. And Michael has had to really spend some time developing his mana. And that's going to start to catch up with him in a big way if Paul's just going to slam back-to-back -back companies and hit on both. And now he has Negate to back it up. I wouldn't have even hated a main phase company there, considering you have the negate. Okay, he's going to prioritize the Sylvan Advocate over the negate. I like that. Feeling like I can leave up negate now. If my opponent goes for something really scary, a planeswalker or whatever, I'll negate it. And if they don't, collected company. Probably GG, or at least put him in a super commanding position. Let's see what he's got. A tireless tracker. Well... He could go for a collected company now and try to hit a spell queller. It looks like I that's like what it. he's going to do. It's always an interesting choice there. He's got one spell queller and one reflector mage already out. So <laughs> how about just hit one of both? <laughs> wow. That is Brutal. gross. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Put that back in your hand. And in case you were sandbagging the land, you can't even recast the thing. Yeah, is this game just over right It now? may be. It may be. I see a Lumbering Falls there. Now Lumbering Falls is a 5-5. Five, five. It's yeah. lethal. He has lethal, even yeah. through Liliana getting activated. And he's tagging for 17, yeah. And that's it. Paul Rietzel wins. Man, that consistency is so savage. We it's saw, so good. We saw Michael stumble just a bit here. He even picked up lands on the you know two of the next three turns. And Paul Rietzel's like, hey, this train doesn't stop for anybody. I'm playing yeah. creatures, I'm hitting, and we're going. And the again, the same thing, the same thing every and time. And, and then on top of it, his collected companies are so sweet. I mean, okay, fine, he hit perfect on that last one. Yeah, like, let's, yeah, not, yeah. let's not beat around the bush. But still, he set himself up to, to do that as often as possible. This is a, a fun deck to join in late on, the four-color amalgam deck. Luckily, it's not quite as crazy as last time. Glad it's fun for you. It, the, like, this board's actually reasonable, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. some of these boards are really tough to just jump in on, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. This one looks pretty reasonable, though. Okay, good. I was worried that he was looking through his graveyard right there <laughs> for a moment. Yeah, well, that's the other thing is that you do have to do that, right? Like, yeah, very you know, often. You, as the expert, have to sit here and, like, start unwinding these board states and they get pretty complicated and what's in the graveyard has a lot to do with what's gonna, how the game's going to end up. Man, Paul Rietzel. Paul Rietzel is something amazing, especially, you know, we sit here, we watch him, he loses game one. It's like this 36-minute grind fest 
There's, the clock is winding down, and then he's, his deck just fires on all cylinders two games in a row, takes it home. Narrowly lost that game, and he had to play, and his opponent played Emrakul twice. If he's almost winning those. <laughs> yeah. This is game three, of course, between these two players. Jen is 11 and 0. Allen's 10 and 0, but he's also got a draw on the record, which you'll see quite a bit of here in Portland. Uh, again, that this format has lent itself to be to, to longer games, and so that you'll see a few more draws maybe than normal of the unintentional variety, of course. It's never fun to draw, especially earlier in a tournament. Wow, this is so complicated for both players. And the thing is, is cards like Kozlek's Return, just having a presence in the graveyard, it increases the complexity of what's going on. So what are you, what are you seeing here as far as just the board state goes? I mean, right now okay, we've got so a couple of Planeswalkers and one creature facing off. What are, what are the, like, what is even happening right now? Okay, so, uh, like, I think right now they're both just trying to leverage their Planeswalkers and try to win a card advantage war. It doesn't seem like Zinsui has anything going on in terms of prized amalgam interactions in his graveyard. There is, however, a Haunted Dead in his graveyard, so that can be used to protect his Jace by, you know, he could jump block with the token if he wants to. Uh-huh. Um, then he can also use it to, you know, emerge an Elder, elder Deep Fiend if he needs to, and then that can tap down blockers on Alan's end step and then allow him to attack through and kill the Planeswalker. So there are a lot of things that can happen in that regard. Uh, from the looks of it, I guess since we didn't have enough cards in his hand mm. to discard that Haunted Dead yeah, to discard two protect, cards. but... Or they were just too good to discard. Well, that's right, like he yeah. has them, but yeah. He actually let his Jace die there to the attack. So now he's got to try to rebuild. Well, he looks to have another copy or two of Jace in his hand here. Jace, so good in this deck. Like, I think this is this is the best Jace deck in Standard, in my mind. Um, and That's I saying something, that too, because Jace wants dominated Standard. He's definitely fallen down a notch, but if you can make Jace look like he used to look, mm -hmm. pretty powerful stuff happening here. Yeah, and the thing is, is that, you know, we'll see these Bant Company decks that we've been looking at a lot recently, and uh, most of the better lists or the better performing lists aren't even playing Jace anymore. Uh, like Paul's deck, I don't think he has Jace anywhere in the 75. And I th the major reason for that, again, is that, he, you know, he cut all the spells except the companies, essentially. So Jace doesn't really perform that well. He can't be, you know, flashing back Jermokas commands and using it in that regard. And he wants all of his creatures to be pressuring his opponent, all of his games to play out the same way. He doesn't want these decks or these games where, you know, he's got a multiple personality deck that's trying to control the game and kill the opponent. I'll tell you what, Jake. These guys are going to have to pick up the pace here if they're going to finish this match. Since we've come in, it's been like a turn. Oh, yeah, I think they uh, may uh, have gone to turns as soon as we joined in. Are they just in turns in. right I think, now? I think Is turn zero happening? started, like, a right, little we'll, we'll after get, we started watching. We'll get confirmation. They're, no? No, they're still on the clock, we're being told. I, Ooh, well. Oh, that's a safe assumption from what you said, but it turns out it's not true. So, oh, easy there, Jin. So the players have to be really careful about the way that they communicate in these scenarios about when combat's going to happen, mainly because, you know, uh, Elder Deep Fiend exists now. Right? You know, if you're, oh, I'm going to attack with these two, and then you say, well, I'd rather have you back up now that I know which ones you're going to attack with. I mean, here it looks pretty straightforward to attack there. But if Jin wants to make the play that you said earlier, you know, get get a Haunted Dead back on the battlefield or whatever, and, you know, this kind of stuff, it, it, it can get really touchy about the timing on it. I definitely urge people playing standard right now to be very clear about it. I'd like to go to combat. May I? And if the answer is yes, you can start declaring attackers and... You know, oh, interesting that Zinn didn't just gobble up the, the Nissa with the Haunted Dead Elder Deep Fiend play. 
Well, what happened here is, as it turns out, Allen has minus his Liliana for the last time. Did not see what he grabbed. Did you see what he grabbed, Jake? I didn't, but he an grabbed Emmerich it out of, went it, to it, the I know an Emmerich went there, and I thought, well, that's got to be it. But instead, I figured that wasn't it. He grabbed something from the from the middle, and now you can see the play that you had outlined before. Bang, 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 bang. So Kozlek's return is going to trigger, wipe the board, leave. Jin with the 5 6 Elder Deep Fiend and apparently a 1 1 Flying Spirit token as well. Yeah, I like how he was able to cast the Elder Deep Fiend with the trigger upon a dead on the stack so that the Kozlek's return trigger went off before the Spirit trigger resolved. Got to get that value. <laughs> now, yeah, one Spirit matters. Yeah, it does. And, you know, his plan was to attack three times 6 12 18, you're dead. But unfortunately for Jin, Alan actually had a copy of Murder sitting in his hand there and was able to kill the Elder Deep Fiend and reduce. Jin's board from uh, six power to one. Looks like that difference. one sitting there may be the extra turns die now. Let's see if we can find out. Yeah, it is. Okay, so that die sitting in the middle of the screen, that's your extra turns. Of course, here at this level of play, we'll go to five extra turns. And... Uh, Ooh, one per player here. There's an Ishkanan now from Allen who has Jin down to six life. Jin's going to discard a land and keep a prize amalgam in hand. Is Jin going to pick up his first loss here, or is Allen going to pick up his second draw here? I think that... Jin could win the game, though it feels like it's going to be tough for him to get 17 damage in with the turns already in effect. And with Ishkana on the battlefield. But there are ways he's going to ultimate that he price can, uh, Ishkana, squash the spider. There are ways that he can deal a lot of damage very quickly okay. uh, post-board. Okay. Um, I, so I he's believe not he has dead. An I believe he does have access to, like, he could, let's say, like, hypothetically, if, if he's able to produce enough bodies on the turn, on this turn, then on turn four, if he can find access to a card like Decimator of Provinces. Oh, jeez. Which is usually somewhere in the 75, these four-color amalgam decks, often in the sideboard. Wow. That, that is a way to pile on an uh, absolute ton of damage. The one issue is that eh, it might be questionable to be bringing in the Decimator against Black Green Delirium. Okay. Well, in the meantime, Alan trying to get Jin from six to zero on his third turn, and then he's going to have the fifth turn as well. He's not attacking Jace. Yeah, this second draw for Allen is very similar to a loss at this stage of the tournament. How do you mean? Uh, well, it's rare that other people are going to have multiple draws. Mm-hmm when the standings cut to a top eight mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. So that second draw doesn't, that extra point added to your standings, doesn't really put you into a new bracket of people. It kind of keeps you where you are. So it's similar to zero in Correct. that way. Yes. Gotcha. Where the first draw doesn't seem to have such a strong effect. Yeah, the first draw means that you're going to make top eight before the X and twos. Yeah. Interesting. So it looks like Jin decided to play Haunted Dead and then double block one of the spiders with the two spirits, losing a spirit. But only dropping to four here rather than any further down. It seems that uh, Zinsui has a pretty good way to slow things down here, too, with Jace. Huh? Cancel that order? Can Allen actually get this win next turn? This is going to be turn four for Jin. So if he's winning this game and the match, it has to happen now. Yeah, this very turn. This turn. It must happen this turn. If he cannot, which it doesn't look like he can, and if he cannot, then he's going to pass a turn, and the whole entire match hinges on if Allen can get those last four life off of Jin or not. And we shall see shortly. This Jace is going to be shrinking something.
Wow. Pretty interesting stuff going on here. I, what are you seeing? Well, basically, Alan needs to draw something that's going to allow him to punch through those last couple points of damage. Whereas, I don't think Zing can really win anymore. Okay. Um, it does seem to be the case. It's interesting in the sense that we really get to Here see all of the angles of this four-color Yeah, amalgam so deck. that was... Zin has given up on winning the game. He has shipped the turn back, and it's just about if Alan can punch through some damage, and that is going to be very difficult. There's three creatures on the other side, plus one of Alan's has been affected by Jace, so... Yeah, the whole game comes down to this turn right here. And he's going to activate and ship, but this is not going to be good enough. Block, Doesn't look like block, it. block, go to two. Alan has to try it, but unfortunately for these two, and really unfortunately for Alan, for the reasons you described a minute ago, Jake, this is going to be a draw. And in Alan's case, another draw. I wonder, I wonder what the standings are going to look like at the end of the day here, just because of how many draws we're going to see, you know? Right, it looks like the players are doing a little bit of discussing. But I think we can call this one good. Uh, you know, this, this is definitely yeah, this is not going draw. to end with a... Uh, you can see the judge kind of stepping in. All right, so why don't, we, why don't we call this one? We can let them discuss. But that's going to do it here for round... 12 from Portland. Test drive the top standard decks from Pro Tour Eldritch Moon in the Pro Tour Gauntlet. Happening now on Magic Online. For more information, visit mtgo.com. Outfit your Magic collection with the newest Eldritch Moon accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and portfolios of your favorite Magic artwork at ultrapro.com.